<laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, my name is Martin, Martin Wallraven, and I'm a um, developer at Meteor, at the um, open source Apollo team. And um, I'll be talking about an, Ap an Apollo GraphQL iOS client I've been working on. Um, so I've been told Berlin is sort of the GraphQL capital of Europe. Um, <laughs> so I'm excited to be here. And uh, there's definitely a lot of interest in GraphQL, it seems. Um, Berlin is not sort of the only city where people are excited about GraphQL, though. Um, a couple of weeks ago, we organized um, sort of the first GraphQL conference, uh, which was completely sold out. Um, over 350 people showed up. Um, and it's not just sort of the amount of people, but also the kind of companies that they represent. Um, like one thing that really stood out was how many people were already working with GraphQL, using GraphQL in their projects within like all these companies, uh, fairly sort of well-known tech companies, other big companies. Um, and what's amazing about this is that this is 2016, um, and um, we've had a few other really sort of big um, um, announcements for GraphQL. One was um, the GitHub public API um, completely switching to GraphQL. Um, pretty big announcement. Um, and again, 2016, um, it's early 2015 when sort of the first public talk about GraphQL was given. And this is, so it's not, it's not that long ago. Uh, a lot has happened since. Uh, GraphQL has been open source. There have been, there have been implementations in uh, quite a few languages. Um, people have um, written amazing tooling around GraphQL. Um, but one of the things I think um, that's also interesting about the way GraphQL has been introduced is that this was a talk about React at a React conference. Um, so people first started talking uh, about GraphQL in the context of data, data fetching for React applications. Um, and this has led to sort of a certain mindset, a certain association of GraphQL with React in particular, JavaScript in general. Um, and what's interesting about this is that um, within Facebook, um, GraphQL at that point had already been in use for almost four years. Um, and it was actually first developed for their native iOS app. So this is 2012. Um, some of you may remember um, the Facebook iOS app before this update. Um, so this was the first sort of fully native uh, iOS app that Facebook developed. Uh, before this, it was an HTML5 app um, that didn't really work very well. Um, and this was the first app that used GraphQL. So GraphQL was developed in the context of this project. Um, and this app has been used by literally hundreds of millions of people over the years. Um, so people have been using GraphQL without knowing it. Uh, GraphQL has been used in production for a long time at a scale that most of us don't actually have to deal with. Um, so before sort of getting into um, talking about GraphQL on iOS specifically, um, I'm not really sure how many of you are iOS developers, how many of you have already worked with GraphQL. Uh, but I'd like to start by sort of answering the why question. Uh, why did Facebook develop GraphQL? Uh, why would you use GraphQL in your app? Like what kind of problems does it solve? Um, and one angle is um, comparing it with alternatives. Um, so anyone who's de developed mobile apps um, is familiar with um, REST APIs. Um, and when you call a REST API, uh, especially for mobile, there are a couple of um, issues that um, you'll encounter. One is overfetching. Um, and the GitHub API uh, 
the GitHub REST API um, is generally seen as a good example of a REST API. It's well designed, it's well documented. Um, so I did a little experiment. Um, imagine you're developing an app and you'd like to show a list of repositories. In this case, all repositories under the Apollo stack organization. Um, so you send a, um, a get request um, and you get a response. And in fact, you get a fairly large response. You get a blob of JSON, um, you get a lot of fields. This is actual data. Um, the full movie lasts um, a full minute. Um, <laughs> and if you're only interested in showing the titles of repositories, uh, this is a lot of sort of data sent over the wire unnecessarily. Um, and what's even worse is that this is probably not all the data you need for your screen. Um, so now imagine you're not just showing the titles of repositories, but you would also like to show uh, the top three contributors, for instance. Um, the GitHub REST API doesn't really allow you to do that in one request. Um, so now you have to make extra requests, um, one per um, repository to get the contributors. Again, you get a lot of unnecessary data, um, but worse, uh, you're making extra round trips. Uh, and all these round trips, especially on, on mobile networks, high latency, um, it means it just, it takes a long time before data, um, b before all the data you need to, um, to create your screen is actually there. Uh, it also means you're doing a lot of unnecessary processing on the device, um, which can be a problem on um, sort of low, lower powered devices. Um, and I'm not saying that there are no solutions for this within sort of the REST paradigm. You can definitely um, solve these problems with a REST API. But the issue there is that it comes at a cost, a very serious cost. Um, because there's, there's a real tension, a fundamental tension between on the one hand, um, only wanting the data you need for a specific screen in a specific sort of version and platform version of your app, like being really specific about the data you need, and on the, on the other hand, keeping all those REST endpoints on your server manageable. Um, and I think this will be familiar to, uh, to a lot of you, um, even sort of tensions within teams, like talking to your backend team, trying to convince them you need that specific endpoint that gives you the data for that screen to avoid making those extra requests. Um, and GraphQL has a really nice solution to this. It's sort of, um, it, it, it's a fairly natural and easy idea, but it's been really well developed. So the idea is that instead of um, servers specifying the data they return on a per endpoint basis, uh, clients specify their data needs. Uh, they specify the data they need for a specific screen at a specific point in time, um, but against the capabilities exposed by the server. And I'll, I'll, I'll talk a lot more about this. Um, so this is a very sort of simple example. Um, you have on the one hand your server. Your server exposes a schema, uh, a set of types that represent sort of the, the, the capabilities uh, the kind of data that you can potentially request. Um, and then on the client, you specify a query in the GraphQL query language. I'll go into more detail later. Um, and you get back JSON. Um, notice that the structure of the query matches the structure of the result. Uh, there is a very sort of, very straightforward mapping between on the one hand, the data requirements, and on the, other, on, the, on the other hand, the actual data you get returned. Um, so I started out by talking about overfetching and avoiding extra round trips. Um, and that's an important part of sort of answering the why question, why you would want to use GraphQL. Um, but there are other solutions to that problem. Um, and I think performance is not sort of the most important issue that GraphQL solves. Um, it's not just about performance, it really, it's really well designed as a language that keeps the needs of product developers in mind. It's not a language that um, offers a 
just a sort of sophisticated technological solution to a problem. We've had sort of web service description languages and other, other potentially um, other technology that could potentially solve these problems. Um, but the GraphQL design philosophy, um, and this is a quote from the GraphQL specification, is so it, it's sort of unapologetically driven by the requirements of views and the front end engineers that write them. And I think that's a really important statement. Um, it's, it's been designed to be usable by people developing basically UIs. And that's a really sort of nice way of thinking about this design problem. Um, so you start with sort of the, the way of thinking of product developers, of UI developers, uh, and, and, and the language and the, the, the runtime are really there to help you write those queries in the language that makes sense to you. Um, so I talked about the schema. Um, the schema is an important part of the contract between your front end and your back end. It's, um, um, it's what allows GraphQL to be strongly typed. The schema defines types, and those types are, um, are what sort of expose the capabilities in a structured way. Um, it's also a very sort of self-documenting way of exposing those capabilities. And the best way of showing that, and I would say the best way of sort of convincing anyone to use GraphQL is uh, graphical. Um, so graphical is um, a really nice integrated query editor. Um, so it has auto completion based on the schema information. Um, I can ask for further information, nested information. Um, it um, has validation built in. Um, and another reason I'm showing this is because um, one of the goals of Apollo iOS is to sort of bring this experience as much as possible to iOS developers. Um, and I'll show some examples of that later. Um, so just... <coughs> Reload probably, it's not completely bug free. Um, so a couple of features, uh, just for those of you who haven't seen this before because I'm referring to them later on when I'm talking about the, uh, uh, about the iOS mapping. Uh, so fragments are a way of um, um, specifying reusable pieces of data um, or data needs. Um, so in this case, uh, we have a reusable fragment called post details. Um, which uh, specifies uh, uh, fields on a post that you might need at certain points in your app. Um, and you can refer to that uh, fragment by sort of spreading it. Um, and that means both um, including that data at that point of use. Um, and as we'll see in the client implementation, it also allows you to clearly abstract over requirements. Um, so fragments are not just a uh, part of the query language, but actually have runtime consequences in Apollo iOS. Um, then there's variables. Um, oh. Another bug. Um, variables are, are a way of uh, parameterizing queries. Uh, they allow you to um, pass values into individual fields. In this case, we're asking, this is the, the standard Star Wars API, a sort of demo API that um, is used in the GraphQL spec and on the graphql.org site. Um, so the hero of a certain Star Wars episode, in this case, um, the hero of um, Return of the Jedi is R2-D2, according to this data set. Um, as we will see, the hero of um, uh, The Empire Strikes Back is Luke Skywalker, according to this data set. Um, I'll show an example of that in iOS later on. Um, and then again, you can use uh, fragments. You can use them multiple times. Uh, you can also use them in sort of nested structures. 
Um, and there's the concept of mutations. So GraphQL is not just a language that allows you to um, request data, but you can also use it to modify data. Um, and th the interesting part of this is that um, um, a mutation is both something that mutates state, but also something that, um, um, that is query-like. Um, you can specify what data you want returned as a result of a mutation. So in this case, uh, we're upvoting a post and we want the, the number of votes back. Um, but in more complicated situations, um, there might be sort of other data that changes as a result of this mutation, um, and um, we specify what data we need returned. So if you want to know more about the GraphQL language, there is a great site, graphql.org. Um, and what's nice about this is that every sort of query fragment here is also a full graphical editor. Uh, it's fully interactive. Um, turns out most people don't notice, um, but it's really neat. <laughs> um, so definitely visit graphql.org if you want to know more about the language. Um, so before talking about the client and about iOS, um, a couple of words about the server side, because you might wonder sort of what, what is actually involved in uh, setting up a GraphQL API. Um, so what's important to realize is that GraphQL is not sort of a database query language. It's not a language that just exposes the sort of raw capabilities of a database. You're not able to perform arbitrary joins, uh, use arbitrary filters. Um, the idea is that you define an application specific schema that exposes the capabilities that make sense to your app. Um, and um, you can build these schemas on top of any sort of data source. You can also combine data from multiple data sources. That's a very powerful feature of GraphQL. Um, so for instance, um, you could have a, um, um, you could have a news feed and your news feed could um, expose a, a sort parameter um, and you could sort, for instance, by date. That could be a simple database um, query, um, but you could also expose an, an algorithmic newsfeed ordering, uh, which would use an entirely different system on the back end, uh, but um, your GraphQL API uh, would actually expose that data in the exact same way. So from a client perspective, um, you're exposing data in two different ways. The back end implementation can be completely different, but um, the, um, it, it's geared towards application developers. You're really carefully designing your schema to um, expose the capabilities that product developers need in an efficient way. So you're not exposing things that are not efficient or not efficient at scale or that might have security repercussions. Um, and then just if you, if you want to see some actual code, this is sort of the simplest implementation of a uh, GraphQL schema in, um, in JavaScript. Um, you specify resolver functions for every type uh, that in this case just return data from sort of an in-memory structure. So it's a very simple, uh, very simple server, um, but it already gives you all the power of GraphQL because the runtime execution model comes from, uh, from the GraphQL library implementation, in this case GraphQL JS, the, the, the JavaScript reference implementation. So that will parse the query, um, make sure that your resolver functions are called in the right order, um, and as a schema developer, you're focused on exposing the right data at the right time. So in this case, you're exposing all posts. Um, when someone um, requests posts, you're exposing uh, the post for a specific author is if someone refers to that field. Um, and in this way, your, your, your schema, your server implementation is free to perform backend fetches on sort of whatever system makes sense to you. Um, we've, we've heard examples of people who've um, combined sort of dozens of legacy systems and uh, uh, microservices into one schema. So their product developers no longer have to know where data lives. Uh, they can get it efficiently in one request. Um, and they, they're also free to sort of evolve their backends, uh, like move microservices around. Um. So 
any backend, any client, any language. That's sort of how we like to think about GraphQL. Um, and this is just a small selection of, um, of all the libraries that are out there in, in every possible language. Um, it's, it's kind of amazing um, how much has happened uh, in the community. Like people have written implementations and tooling around it in, in all these different languages. Um, but as a front-end developer, um, you might be interested in the client side. So how do you actually use a GraphQL API? Um, well, the simplest way is to um, send a, an HTTP request. You can just use curl. Um, you send the query as, um, um, as a post body in this case, and you just get back JSON. Um, so you may not actually need anything beyond this in some cases, um, especially for, um, um, for JavaScript apps. Using JSON may actually be fine, directly using JSON in your app. Um, as iOS developers, though, um, like raw JSON, dealing with raw JSON is a pain. Um, basically, um, you get data returned as untyped dictionaries. Um, you have to continuously, um, sort of, as you navigate through the data, uh, cast results to the right type, make sure you're dealing with um, the possibility of values being nil. Um, so your code gets really complicated, really, really fragile, bound to specific uh, result structure. Um, so that's one of the reasons there are so many <laughs> JSON libraries for Swift. It sort of it seems to be the favorite um, starter project for a lot of people with Swift. It's something that a lot of people have taken, taken up. Um, also because JSON is, JSON parsing is a really interesting problem and it, you, you get to use a lot of the interesting but also somewhat obscure features of Swift in some cases. Um, but most, most of these JSON libraries um, work by defining mappings between a JSON structure and uh, Swift types. Uh, and most often people choose to map JSON results to structs, to value types. Um, so there are different ways in which you can specify the mapping, um, but usually you actually start out by writing your structs in Swift. Um, and then you specify the mapping in whatever um, API these libraries make available. Um, but we have something different in GraphQL, we have the schema, and the schema is already a strongly typed uh, structure. Um, so one way of um, writing a GraphQL client for a language like Swift might be to simply take the schema, take the types defined in the schema, um, and um, either write by hand uh, structs for it or code generate. Uh, code generation might make more sense in the long term um, it's uh, an approach that um, has been used within Facebook for um, quite a few years. Um, but there's a limitation to the idea of mapping types in your schema directly to structs in Swift. And the problem here is that like, one of the big advantages of GraphQL is that you get to specify the exact data you need. Um, these types, um, actually contain all the data that's available on the server. They're the capabilities. They're not the actual data that you request. Um, so you end up with a long list of properties in your structs. They're all optional. Um, um, you can never be sure which data is actually there um, because um, the query is where you specify what data you want. Um, so a much better solution is to use query-specific models. So you take both the schema and a query, and you then generate query-specific types. So these types only contain properties for data that is actually there. Um, the compiler simply won't allow you to, for instance, um, access the last name of the author, um, which makes sense because that's something you didn't request in the query. So um, I talked about fragments a bit. Um, 
and fragments. Yep. Ah, that's, that's a good question, actually. Um, it's the schema itself that defines whether data is optional. And in this case, uh, the only required, fee, required property is the ID. Um, I, I would advise people to use non-optional types whenever they can really be sure there is a value for something. Like, for instance, if you can be sure uh, a post always has a title, um, it might be nicer to make that a, a, a non-nullable type. But at least you can differentiate between the case where a value is actually null on the server um, and where you simply didn't request that data. So that, that's already a nice consequence. Um, and fragments are, like I said, a way of um, uh, sort of specifying reusable pieces of data you need. Um, and as we will see, um, that maps nicely onto sort of a component-based UI model. So different parts of your UI might specify their own data dependencies. Um, so in, 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 on iOS, for instance, your table view cells might specify their own data dependencies, and then the table view doesn't have to know what data is needed by individual cells or cell types. Um, it simply refers to the fragment by name, and then the cells themselves specify their data needs. I'll show an example of that later. Um, and that leads to something you might call fragment models. So then you, you, you actually generate structs for individual fragments. So it's time for some actual Xcode action. Um, this is Apollo iOS. Um, it includes um, both a um, build time component, a runtime component, and an Xcode integration. So it's it's kind of a complicated system. Um, the Xcode integration, I think, is really interesting. It, um, it does syntax highlighting of your GraphQL queries. Um, but what's, what's nice about Xcode is that it allows you to show uh, multiple files side by side. Um, so this is called um, an assistant editor. Um, this feature was originally developed for Objective-C, like showing your interfaces and implementations side by side. But it works with different file types. Um, so here we have a uh, post list view controller, a table view controller that shows a list of posts. Um, so just, for, just to make this a little more concrete, this is the actual app. Um, this is a very simple example app that we've written in different languages. Um, and all it really does is it shows a list of posts and it allows you to upvote posts. Um, so this is a, a table view controller. Um, and here in the load data method, uh, we simply perform a fetch with a query, the old posts query. And the old posts query is code that is generated from this GraphQL here. Um, and then in this case, we, um, we get a list of posts. And each post um, contains a post details fragment. And um, the table view controller doesn't know what that fragment actually contains. And it doesn't have to know. It just has to know the name. It knows that it's called post details. Um, so here, it calls configure with on a table view cell, passing it the fragment. Um, but the fragment is defined within um, a table view cell. And notice that the corresponding GraphQL file sort of automatically changes. This is a really nice sort of way of working because it, it, it clearly shows you what belongs together. Um, so in this case, we have a, uh, we have a cell um, and uh, we here have the dependencies. And if, for instance, I comment out title here um, and rebuild, um, I get a compile time error. Um, so I get sort of compile time data safety. I think this is, it's, it's something that people will, like people who have sort of more complicated data-driven apps will really appreciate. Um, it, it also works the other way around. Um, like if I try to access email here, um, I actually get a, an inline validation error from the GraphQL schema. So the server does not know the field email here. Um, 
Um, no, you, you usually download the schema and keep it in your project. Um, so as a, uh, as a JSON file, schema.json. And you, like, people have different ways of dealing with this, but um, in most cases, I think it makes sense to keep it sort of in version control, under version control. Um, so when you change the server um, schema definition, you have to remember to like, update all your um, JSON files and your client repositories. Yeah. Yeah, although, um, but I'll say a little more about this, um, an important feature of GraphQL is backwards compatibility. Um, so your old clients should still be able to work against the new schema, uh, just that if you need new features, features from the new version of the schema, then you have to re-download the schema. Um, so of course, because these are, well maybe I should actually, just for reference, sort of these, these are examples of the code that is generated. Um, and this is sort of still work in progress, like we're implementing new features. The generated code will likely change. It's not something you're supposed to edit yourself or get too attached to. It's not a public API, but it does show sort of how things work. Um, and it's, it's actually a fairly readable, um, fairly readable model. Um, and then of course, because these are just, um, because these are just Swift types, you get things like code completion. So I can show the number of votes, for instance, instead of the title. Um, I can also um, use the, 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 the generated fragment type as an argument, for instance, to a function. So here I have a function that gives you a, a byline for a post. Um, so we have a helper function that actually works on the generated type. Um, you can even um, extend the type. So for instance here, I've written a full name function for the author. Um, you can just use that. Um, there's also an example of a mutation here. So mutations are also uh, generated, uh, generated classes, a uh, post mutation here. Um, and you just call perform mutation. Um, what's interesting about both like perform mutation and um, uh, fetch query here is that it uses, like these are generic methods. So the um, result here is of the right type. Um, it's just a type that belongs to that specific query. So here I can access posts. Um, and here, for instance, on post details, I can access title, but if I, again, would remove title here, um, I would get a compile time error there. Um, so everything is really type safe. Um, there are sort of more complicated parts to the mapping and um, this probably only makes sense if you know a little more about GraphQL, and I don't really have time to go into too much detail, uh, but the Graph GraphQL type system is um, quite advanced. Um, for instance, it has interfaces. Uh, so interfaces are a way of um, sort of grouping, um, grouping types. Um, so in this case, um, um, hero, uh, so the hero of a uh, Star Wars movie, is actually of type character. Character is an interface uh, and it has uh, concrete types, droid and human. Um, so um, they both have a name, like name is part of the character interface, um, but those concrete types also have type specific fields. Um, and this is what is called an inline fragment in GraphQL, uh, which allows you to specify a type condition um, and then access information that is specific to a type. Um, so that all works in, um, um, in Apollo iOS. So for instance here, I can also say as human, and humans have a height. Um, so for R2D2, um, there's no height because um, droids don't have a height, only humans have a height. Um, if I change the episode here to 
empire. Um, it's the other way around. So that's Apollo iOS, uh, and I think sort of the, the nicest feature is that you really get static type safety. You really take advantage of both the strong typing of GraphQL and Swift, um, and the developer experience is kind of incredible. It, it really helps you um, avoid a lot of mistakes at build time, um, and it makes life a lot easier because you have sort of the full power of GraphQL. Um, and there are more advantages of sort of GraphQL in general for um, developers, for product developers. Um, I think, I mean, I already mentioned um, sort of the tension between front end and back end, uh, like having to ask for specific endpoints or having to build them yourself if you're um, a full stack developer. Um, but in many cases, uh, product developers are actually blocked on backend developers, uh, like they need a certain endpoint um, for a certain screen um, in order to have it run efficiently, um, and they can't even build their feature without that endpoint. Um, so it really empowers product developers. So product, product developers are really happy with this, um, with sort of the, the power of specifying their own data needs. And this is something we've heard from people within Facebook, for instance, um, where they They've experienced this for a number of years. Um, they even use graphical during their developer orientation, we've heard. Um, and it's really, like, like they, they really say it's, it's like one of the, um, um, sort of one of the big enabling factors that allows them to ship apps um, at the speed they do. Um, but it's also nice for backend developers. Uh, so depending on sort of how you write your backend, um, it's, it, it, you might be used to um, sort of being at the servers, service of individual clients. Um, and with GraphQL, you can really focus on schema design, on, on designing a schema that makes sense for your company or for your problem domain. Um, and um, you're still talking to front-end developers. You, you still have to make sure that you expose the capabilities they need, um, but you don't have to do that on just an individual basis. Um, you're thinking about sort of the more general picture, D developing, designing a really great schema for your um, company or project. Um, so we already mentioned this a little bit um, um, in the context of sort of using your schema within Apollo iOS, um, but with REST APIs, because the server specifies what data it returns, um, there's often a need for versioning. Um, um, and um, with GraphQL, in most cases, you can actually avoid versioning completely um, if you make sure that schema changes are always um, backwards compatible. Um, and this sounds maybe like sort of a theoretical thing, um, but within Facebook, um, they, they've strictly adhered to this, and they claim that even their app from 2012 uh, still runs against the same endpoint, and they, they actually release uh, new versions of their apps on their different platforms every couple of weeks, so they have hundreds of versions running against their same endpoint, um, and they've never had to introduce a backwards incompatible change. So if Facebook can do it at their scale, um, I think most of us should probably be able to manage as well. Um, they even have some really interesting sort of integrations with our CI process. So if you make a change to a schema, it will automatically tell you if it breaks a certain client, um, a certain client version even. Um, so what's next for Apollo iOS? Um, well, it's an open source project. Um, so a lot depends on how people are using it, um, what they need, um, and um, hopefully, what they want to contribute. Um, so definitely, if you're interested in either using it or contributing to it, um, get in touch, um, either sort of directly uh, or um, open an issue or a pull request if you have specific ideas. Um, but there are a couple of features that um, um, like are on our list of things to work on that we think are important to, to work on. Uh, caching is definitely at the top. This is something we, we know a lot of people want and need. Um, 
caching is important, not just for performance, um, but also for consistency, making sure that um, data that's updated from one query actually gets reflected in uh, other parts of your UI, uh, and caching, sort of normalized caching solutions that, uh, for instance, uh, our Apollo JavaScript clients use um, are the best way of dealing with that. And then there are other features like optimistic UI, pagination, subscriptions for real-time updates um, that um, we're excited about and hopefully we'll be able to um, work on soon or uh, even better um, work on together with other people who have a need for these. Um, I mentioned Apollo client. So Apollo iOS is part of a whole family of clients. Um, we have um, um, a client for React. Um, we have a, um, that, that client also works for React Native. Um, then we have an Angular client, um, and Camille will talk about that after this. Um, and then there's the iOS client that I already mentioned. Um, missing here is an Android client. Um, so um, we've actually started working on this with some contributors, um, but there is still a lot of work to do. Um, so if you're interested in Android also, definitely get in touch and uh, hopefully we can make this happen sooner. Um, and as a company, Apollo um, is focused on sort of both the open source side of things. We have our Apollo client and Apollo uh, and our GraphQL server and tools, uh, but we're also working on uh, commercial services, um, developer tooling in this case, uh, Apollo Optics. So that's a way of showing you um, schema usage, uh, like both what fields are used by what clients, um, but it also um, shows you performance information at a uh, individual resolver, an individual field level. Um, so if you're interested, uh, there's a 14-day uh, trial. Um, and our main website is apollodata.com, so that's where you'll find both the open source and the commercial um, side. Um, there's the Apollo Stack GitHub um, with our different projects. Um, and um, we're also hiring, so if you're interested in working on GraphQL full-time, um, definitely uh, get in touch. And um, yeah, I um, think we have time for questions. All right. Yeah, I um, think we have like five minutes for questions, then a five-minute break, and then the second talk. Um, you take it from here. Uh, yeah, uh, sure. Um, uh, yeah. How does uh, Optics integrate um, with the server? Is it bound to a specific uh, like tech stack, or how does it work? Yeah, good question. Um, it does require an agent running on the server, um, and we currently have an agent um, for um, for Node, um, and a um, which is production ready, and we have a, a beta um, agent for Ruby. Um, and we're working with um, sort of the community to develop agents for, uh, for other environments. So if you have specific needs, uh, definitely get in touch on, um, I don't think I mentioned this, but you can get there from the Apollo Data website. We have uh, an Apollo Slack, uh, and there is a, um, there's a, a channel for agent implementers as well there. So and the agents, are they working with, um, I don't know, like Relay for Ruby or something? Like um, I mean, they're, they're bound to a specific GraphQL server implementation. So there's GraphQL Ruby, for instance, the main Ruby implementation. Um, so our agent integrates with that, um, and that, that's what gives you sort of the, the, the field level timing information, for instance. Yeah. Um, I had a question about uh, serialization formats. Mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned that uh, everything uses JSON. I was wondering if it's common to find other serialization formats, such as Protobuf. It's, and it's not common, um, but it's definitely something that's allowed by the spec. Um, so the, the, JSON is by far, I don't actually know of anyone who uses it with another serialization format, but in theory you could. Um, something um, Facebook has found uh, working with different serialization formats is that in many cases just using JSON compression on JSON is actually a a fine way of dealing with this. Um, um, it's just about the transmission, or how, how much data you're transmitting, it's more about how long it takes to unmarshal. Yeah. Well, I mean, one of the benefits of GraphQL is that hopefully 
you're not overfetching, so you only have the data that you need, so that, that should make a difference. And I know there was sort of an experimental project within Facebook of even building type-specific JSON parsers, if you really want sort of <laughs> all the performance you can get. So because you have the type information, JSON is not just sort of an untyped blob, but you know what to expect, and you might be able to get some performance. I just quickly cloned the project, Apollo iOS, around the test, and they crash somehow. Well, <laughs> so my, my question is not about this. Mm -hmm. uh, probably, like, every tool has its lim limitations. So you didn't mention the single one. Maybe which are they? Um, hmm. I mean, that's a very open-ended question. <laughs> um, Did you encounter any problems with using Graph? Well, um, especially writing for like, big, big iOS projects. Um, I mean, I think to, to, to get back to your first point, why it's not working when you uh, clone the project, um, it does require a, a setup. Um, like, for instance, you need the Apollo code gen tool to actually generate the code. The okay, well, l yeah. Um, so it's, it's, it's still... Um, it has different moving parts, um, and um, um, so that is definitely something where. No, no, no. These are two different topics. One of them mm -hmm. is the uh, maturity of tool itself. It's uh, like uh, understood that it's uh, not uh, probably mature enough. But the question is, GraphQL itself does it have like this concept? Does it have any limitations that you are aware of? Um. I mean, it's definitely not, like REST is a sort of well understood standard. Um, like if you're, especially if you're working with external developers, if you have a public API, I think right now GraphQL might be a barrier. Like if you're not GitHub, um, but you're a smaller company, you're exposing a public API and it's a GraphQL API, you might have problems attracting developers. Um, so that's definitely something. It's um, I, I think as, as a technology, um, I mean, I'm probably biased or um, oh, too enthusiastic. Fine, it's fine that there is no, any, like, no issues. Well, I mean, I'm, I'm pretty sure there are, there are issues, and there, there are definitely things we'd like to improve about GraphQL, um, the, like the, the, the things about the type system or about the language or features we'd like to add. Um, but sort of the basic, the basic structure seems solid. Um, Yeah. yeah, sure. And, yeah, and <laughs> we can talk later. Yeah. Uh, how Plus. much of the API will change after Apollo iOS? Mm. Right now, the API is really simple. Uh, so it only has a fetch, and, a fetch query and a um, perform mutation function. Um, I don't think those are likely to change, um, but they're both sort of the, the one-shot request type. Uh, like you, you, you fetch a query, you get a result. Uh, and um, some, of, some of the features we're working on, like the, the, the consistency management and caching, optimistic UI, uh, subscriptions or real-time updates, they'll lead to a different programming model, I think, where um, you define callbacks that get called multiple times instead of just getting sort of a single, a, a one-time result. Um, so that doesn't mean that the old way of doing things won't work, but um, I think best practices will definitely change a little. All right, perfect. Thank you so, so much. It was like...